Welcome to Wadsworth History on Film, a program presented by the Wadsworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history of Wadsworth for posterity. I'm Cesar Carino, your host, and our guest today is Garland Christian. Garland, it's hard to believe as I look across this table and see a, an energetic, young-looking person <laughs> Thank who you. is almost 90 years old. Is that correct? Almost. When will you be 90? Next May, May 7th. Next May. What day? May 7th. May 7th, you'll be 90 years old. Right. You um, are presently living where? Liberty Residence, and Wadsworth. And where did you live when you, before you went to Liberty Residence? I lived on Clark Road. On Clark Road. For, for eight years. Before that, where I did you I lived on Baird Avenue for 48 years. 48 years on Baird, and wow. And Overlook for five years. Overlook on five, so let's see if I can get that right. Eight and 48, or 56 and five, or 61. That was my married life. That's your married life. We also lived on, uh, when we came to Wadsworth, we lived on South Lima Street. And uh, then we moved to South Main Street, way down past Seville Road. Where did you live on South Lyman and South Main? I think South Lyman was, if I remember that, uh, two houses up from Franklin School. Two houses north? Yes. On which side of the road? On the west side. West side of the road from Franklin School. Are those houses there now? No. No, they're, no. They, they're a playground or a parking lot or yeah, something, something like that. Right. And then you live south of um, Seville, Seville Road. road on uh, South Main Street. Do you yes. remember the, the number? We didn't have numbers in those didn't days. Didn't have numbers in those days. It. it was about the fifth house, I believe, mm -hmm. from Seville Is it a brick house? No, it's a frame house. A frame house, I see. Now, when did you come to Wadsworth? Came to Wadsworth in uh, about 1920. 1920. 1920. You have been here, you were 18 years old, or uh, see, so you were born in 1908, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were about 12 years 12 old years when old. you came. What brought you to Wadsworth, Garland? Well, I was born in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. Oh, really? A little community called Prairie Grove, just near Fayetteville. And uh, my folks were farmers. We lived in a log cabin, a big, sprawly two room affair. And uh, so things were pretty hard there. Uh, it was back in those 1908. That uh, uh, it was hard to make a living, especially as a farmer. What was the economy like in 1908? Very, very well. Of course, it was very tight, mm -hmm. very slim. Hard to make a living. In now farming. you were uh, you were not the only child of the. Oh uh, no! And who were your parents? My parents were. Uh, Yates Christian and uh, Clara Nee Franklin. Clara Nee Franklin. Well, Clara Franklin, that was our maiden, maiden name. Franklin. Franklin. And uh, Yates Christian. Yates Christian. Now that, that seems to be, you have the name Garland, His, your father's name was Yates. That seems to be somewhat of an ethnic uh, name. What, uh, what was your nationality background? Well, Irish English as far as I can find out. And, uh, that's about all I know about Irish and English, yeah. and they settled probably in the Ozark Mountains. Well, they, my parents were raised in West Virginia. They were in West Virginia. And they originally. migrated to Fayetteville, Arkansas, Arkansas, that area. And then from there, we came to Burbank, Ohio. Why? What, what was in Burbank? My dad and my son, or uh, my brother Homer, and a bunch of cousins, which we had around there, all came to Burbank and got jobs on the railroad. Which railroad, you remember? Erie. Erie Railroad. Yes. And the Erie Railroad in Burbank was actually the main line from Chicago to New York. That is right. And it was a very thriving very, railroad. Very, very busy one. And so, so busy that uh, it actually uh, probably employed thousands and thousands of people yes. at one time. Of course, then the demise of the railroads in the 40s and the 50s, when automobiles became much more uh, active. That's right. And the part of um, uh, the transportation system uh, caused the railroad people to find other types of employment. What did your father do on the railroad? Worked on a section. A section gang? Yes. Tell us what a section gang is and what they do. <laughs> I know because I worked on one of them. For you two, know what they're like? I worked on one for two summers. What are they like? Well, they, uh, they lay ties, they lay rails, they uh, 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 level off the grade. They just do anything to keep the railroad uh, uh, bed in shape for the trains because 
The trains are always bouncing up and down. And, and if and they get a low spot, they've got to build it up. They've got to build it up. There's always something to do. There was a particular cadence with the uh, section game people when they would, um, uh, would pound railroad ties into the ties. Can you tell us about that? I sure can. I was uh, on the section for two summers in uh, Ripon later on. And I worked with a young man about 23 years old. And he was big and brawny and athletic. And he was a spiker. He was that a was spiker. His job. That's his job. Well, we took a liking to one another. And he taught me to spike. And we became a team. And we would swing in rhythm. And he show hit us how you do hit. that. Well, uh, I'll pretend that I'm one spiker. <laughs> OK. I down. And you back. And then I down. Back. And that's the way it goes. And how fast could you put a spike in? Oh, we could put one in pretty fast. What would you use to pound the spikes in? It was a maul about so big around and weighed about, uh, I think, about two pounds. Was it only two pounds? I thought it was an eight pound maul. I, it could have been. I don't yeah. remember. It was, uh, I remember that it, the longer we use it, the lighter it got. The lighter it got. You got strong. <laughs> uh, you had what were called section bosses. Yes. Who always wore a white shirt. Was that correct? Or they always were dressed up? They always were a little, yes. Uh -huh. And they, they uh, were not really known for, um, um, shall we say, um, um, getting their hands dirty. Getting, getting their hands dirty. I was, <laughs> was going to try to say something a little bit less um, uh, formidable than getting your hands dirty. They, they really considered themselves to be a, um, a, a power source, did they not? Yes. And they usually were. Uh, not too terribly polite, as I remember, yes. is that correct? And they were taskmasters of the first water, just one step above slavery. Yes. Was that correct or not? Well, yes. Uh, fortunately, I worked for two very fine uh, supervisors or section bosses, and uh, I always got along well with them. And uh, uh, they were pleased with my work, and they were treating me square. And I don't have no complaints. You had no them, complaints so. about them, but they. But the types of people who typically were on section gangs were not necessarily the, uh, the most, art, the, the, the most uh, sophisticated, were they? We had a man by the name of uh, Woody Ditch from Burbank, who was a retired uh, service man, and he was an engineer. And he uh, had a section gang, a, a special gang of about 100 people. And he was excellent. I mean, he was a real man, and his father, uh, John Ditch was a Civil War veteran, D-I-T-C-H. Mm -hmm. And when I came to Burbank, I was 10 years old, and the school year was just about out. So I got a job on the muck, Lodi muck. Mm -hmm. I was 10 years old, got 17 cents an hour, weeding onions. But I rode to work in a wagon with this John Ditch, this veteran. What kind of wagon was it? Well, it was an <laughs> open bed wagon and a springs on it for him to sit on. And, and we had little benches along the side that were Horse drawn. Horse drawn. Of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would ride to, to uh, the muck gardens and weed onions. And that was our job. I 17 did that. cents an hour. 17 cents an hour. How much did you get on the railroad? Oh, it was about a dollar and a quarter, I think, the tops that I ever got. A day. A day? A day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you, all you did was swing that sledgehammer all day long for well, that Oh, yeah, that was my job. But we would do anything. But uh, when we would have a, a section of track to lay, that was my job. I even was put out to flag trains when sometime. And one time I dozed off because I had no trains. And all of a sudden, I hear a whistle. And I looked up, there comes a train. <laughs> you heard him in a hurry. <laughs> frantically waving a flag. And <laughs> the engineer got mad. He stopped the train. He said, what's going on? I said, well, you've got to slow down for the next town. <laughs> so he went ahead. <laughs> mm. How long did you do that? Two summers. Two summers. And wh how old were you at the time? I was uh, a junior and senior in high school. In other words, you're 16 and 17 years of age. Yes, I was working. And that's the kind of work you did. I worked all my life. Where did you graduate from high school? Wadsworth High. Wadsworth High School, what year? 27. 1927. Who was the superintendent and principal at the time? Uh, let's see, Mayhew was, and... Um, Close? Close. Frank Close and, and Mayhew. Mayhew, yeah. 
You then went all the way through school in the Wazza schools with the exception of the first and second grade, is that correct? No. I went to school two years in Burbank and two years in uh, Ripman. Oh, I see. You I didn't... came. I was in the fifth grade when I came to uh, Wadsworth. And where did you go to school in Wadsworth? Frank, Franklin School. At Franklin School. Where did you live then at that time? Just South on South Lyman. Street. South Lyman Street. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, your father then did he do anything else besides railroad? Oh work? no, he worked for the, the salt company in Wadsworth for a number of years. That's what I was yeah. hoping you would say because we would like, we have not heard very much about the salt company. Yeah. What can you tell us about the salt company, Garland? I would take my dad's uh, dinner pail down to him. Uh, almost every day. And I remember that the swells that they had the, the drill going down into, that the salt would uh, come up through that and salt water. And uh, it would just eat the soles off of the, their shoes. And, their, and lots of times they would, their shoes would hardly last a week. And just, just cake their clothes and, and shoes. And, uh, but it was a job and it was interesting. What uh, what did your dad do at the salt works? Well, I I really don't know. He was a, a laborer. I suppose he had a signed job. I know he was watching that that drill. That drill go up and yeah, down. Yeah. When you t took the the dinner bucket at, at probably eleven thirty, wasn't it? Something like that. At eleven thirty, uh, where did you take it? Where was the salt works? Where did you take it to your father? And how did you get there? Tell us the exact route of how you got well, there. Well, I had to walk. That's the first thing. And I was down State Street, I guess that's the name of the street. Right. And uh, just after you cross that little spur track, why you would walk in the uh, entrance, and uh, that's uh, it wasn't hard to find. It wasn't hard to find. Mm -hmm. What happened to that salt works and when? Oh, they had a big fire one night, and uh, I watched it burn. You watched it burn. Oh, yeah. Where were you when you were watching it burn? I was at burn? home. I heard. Uh, I saw the glow in the sky and I walked down, it was about 10.30 at night and I think half of Wadgeth was there by that time. And where, how old were you at the time? I was about 18, I guess, so I'm guessing, still in high school. Mm -hmm. 18, so about 1926 it happened? Yeah, I would say so, I'm not just sure of the date. Mm -hmm. what, um, what did you, what did you uh, think was happening? I mean, how did the salt works, burn? how does a factory burn down? That's a good question. It's a brick building, and how it got started, I don't know, and, but it really burned. And so I suppose there was something in there that uh, uh, fed the fire, probably a lot of wood uh, frames and so on and so forth. The Wazza Fire Department came down and tried to put it out. Yeah. What was the fire department like at that time? Well, it wasn't as modern as it, as no, it is today. No, well, certainly wasn't. They had a... Where'd they get their water to try to put it out? I think they had a hydrant there that they hooked onto. I... They didn't get it from the match shop pond? They could have, yes. I believe maybe they did. Yeah, I think they got it from the match shop pond. Uh, there was a pond down there. What was in that pond and how did that pond happen to be there? Do you remember Garland? Are you talking about the old comp pond? Yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, it seems to me like that's where the match dumped their water, wasn't it? That's right. And uh, it didn't completely freeze over in the wintertime, especially around the edges, but I was going to bring this up later, but okay, I'll tell you let's, now. Let's, let's I spent hours and hours and hours ice skating back there, and we had the most fun. And uh, so many of the kids who come back there, we never had any bad times, we never had any drinking or smoking oh, or swearing. Not. We played hockey. We'd go there and spend the whole day sometimes. Mm -hmm. Just a marvelous place to. We'd have to be careful if we got too near the inlet or outlet, it'd be very soft and you might go through, but we right. never had anybody go through the ice. Why was the outside perimeter not frozen over? Uh, probably the salt that's composition right. was still in. The composition yeah. was, was still there. Yeah. That's, uh, that's one of the things. However, the inside was frozen. Yes. And that's where Wadsworth skated at one time. Oh, yes. Later on, then they went to the AC field when they would flood it over. But they skated on the match shop pond. Yeah. Uh, why they would call it a pond, I have no idea, except that it, uh, it, um, the definition of a pond is that it's a, a stagnant body of water, I guess. But um, 
Uh, it was m nothing more than a drainage uh, area, wasn't it? Was oh, it not? No, it was a good sized pond. Oh yes, I know, but yes. it, I mean, oh, yeah. it was filled yeah. up with, uh, yeah. with drainage materials. Um, how long did your father work at the um, at the salt? And who was at the salt at the time? Do you remember names of the salt? No, I don't. Uh, the Ohio salt. We just called it the yeah, salt. I don't know. And I don't know how long he worked there, three or four years, I guess. They never rebuilt it, did they? No. However, they maintained the office of the salt yes. works right there in Wadsworth. Yes. Uh, north of the match shops. The yes. office is right north of the match shop. Um, do you have any idea what happened to the salt? Where did the salt go then? Where did the Ohio salt go then? I don't know. I don't, I don't think they were connected with the Ripon salt. I'm not sure. I thought they were, but then we'll have to get that straightened out for history. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll get that, not that information. Sure. So I better not Going say. back to Garland Christian now, you have brothers and sisters. Yes. And how many? Well, let's see. I have uh, three sisters. I had three sisters and, and uh, four brothers. Three and four, seven. Eight. Eight. In, uh, or three, three, and, three and four or seven is right, but you're the eighth one, aren't you? I'm the eighth one, and yes. we had two that passed away. At birth. We had ten. Ten and all together. All together. Mm -hmm. And uh, we still have three living. And uh, you are in the middle, somewhere in yes. the middle. And how many, how old would your oldest sibling be now, Garland? My oldest sibling? 62, I believe. No, your oldest, the, yeah. one, the one who would be older than you, older. <gasps> How old would they be if they were living? Oh, I see what you mean. I have a sister that's 94. She's still living. She's still living. But then you had two sisters beyond that, didn't you? Yes. And how old would they be if they Mamie, were living? Mamie, my oldest sister died when she was 93, and my little sister died when she was about 40 years old. 40. But the four. Older, four. Yeah. But your oldest sister would now be how old? Oh, she, she was born at the turn of the century, was she yeah, not? She would, let's see, she would probably be um, 97. She'd be 100 years old, I 100 guess. 100 years old, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. She was born old. in 1897, close to the turn yeah. of the century. And you'll be 90 years old. Yes. You have a tremendous amount of history to bring us. Now, when your sisters and brothers came to Wadsworth uh, from Ripman, Burbank, and then Ripman. Uh, what did your sisters and brothers do? And who are they and where are they now? Well, my sister Mamie, who was the oldest, married Joe Strausser, who was the ticket agent in the Erie Railroad at Ripman. But uh, then uh, Homer, my oldest brother, became a watchmaker. And Charlie, my other brother, ended up at Maybaugh's for years and years and years. He's since gone. And uh, Ralph, my younger brother, worked all his life to high match. And my next brother, Harold, who died a couple of years ago, uh, was with B&W and, B and for his lifetime work. Now, the one who was the watchmaker, where was he a watchmaker and what, what did he do here in Wattsworth? Well, he, he worked for Bernard for a long time. And then he had a little office all of his own. And then he t took one in Ripman. And, uh, he got married, and then he had his work in his home for a number of years. Now, when you say Bernard, which Bernard, and what did Bernard do for a living? Well, Bernard had, uh, I'm talking the one that had the jewelry store. Jewelry on store. On the corner of um, the square there. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember his first name, but he was a... Uh, Where Nielsen's used to yeah, be. Yeah, and Homer had a, a little office in there, mm -hmm. and workbench. And, and he repaired watches. Yes. And this is when they cleaned the watches and oiled them and stopped them for you yes. if you weren't going to use them for yes. a while and so yes. forth. And uh, he did that for years and years and years. Yes, he did for a long Christian. time. Mm -hmm. Your life itself took a completely different turn. Yep. Tell us how your life evolved from the time that you graduated from high school until the present day. Well, I worked. After I graduated from high school a year, and uh, then I was got a job at Cyberling. I worked about a year, I guess it was. Doing what? 
I was in the payroll department. The payroll. In other words, you never really became involved with heavy manual labor outside of the railroad track, right? Well, that probably cured you right then. There. Well, I enjoyed that. I did a lot of. I worked at the brickyard too. I you worked at the brickyard. I set bricks and I hauled bricks. I drove a team. What years would those have been? During my high school. High school. Yeah, I worked uh, even nights. My dad fired kills down there for a long time at night, and I had to go down and and uh, help him and work with him till maybe twelve, sometimes one o'clock at night. I worked a lot. All that's the reason I didn't. Uh, go for football or basketball very much because I worked a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, you drove a team down at the brickyard. I drove one horse. One horse, one not big, a team. Uh, big, big horse. Big bay horse? Yeah, and we'd go around and collect the ashes around the kills and dispose of them and bring coal around for the men to put in that night or day. And so they'd send me out to the dynamite, dynamite shed to pick up, pick up some dynamite and powder and bring back. And uh, I never had any qualms about it. And you're still alive at my age 90 alive. almost. That's wonderful. And, uh, then what did you do after you? Um... Then I went to Ashland College for one year. And that, and was, that was difficult in those days, wasn't it? Yes, it was. 1927, 1928, and, 29, and, and, uh, there was no money. So I came back and got a job for the summer. And I was the only one in the family working. So I couldn't go back to college. So I hired in uh, to the, with Cyberling as a timekeeper at nights. And Louis Wilson was uh, a timekeeper also. I you mean Louis Wilson, the uh, yeah, attorney? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, he was going to, I guess, the FBI or special training or something, so I took his job. And uh, then we had a lot of Wadjuth boys come in as timekeepers, or Eli Hard Crumrine and uh, Jake Blau and Randall Zepp and Lawrence Good, and I don't know, a whole bunch of them. So I worked in the uh, timekeeping department, and then I went into payroll and worked there, and I went into cost department, and I worked there, and then I went into the billing department, and I worked there, and then they transferred me to the auditing department. That was new. And that's where I spent the greater part of my years. How many years did you work at Cyberling before it I closed? About 43. Were you, were you there when it was closed then? Yes. No, I, were, I retired about five years prior to their closing. And uh, was Lamb then in charge of it, or was Cyberling still in no, charge? No, um, Firestone. Firestone was yeah. in charge of it at Lamb that time. Lamb was in charge for a while, and he sold it Firestone, and Firestone uh, was... Uh, 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 Cyberling became a division of Firestone. Did you know Frank Cyberling? Oh, yes. And what kind of a person was Frank Cyberling? Very quiet, very stately, very uh, always control of himself. But kind of short, wasn't he? Yes, he was short, and C.W. was also short. He was uh, a little more jovial and a little more friendly, I would say, but two very, very fine men. The Cyberlings were all great people. Yeah. You know, they, were, they were good people. I'm very, uh, I'm a very close friend of his sister's, who is Irene Cyberling Harrison. She's oh, yeah. 107 years old, is and she right? lives to be, uh, on the February 25th, 1998, she will be 108 years is old. Is that right? And her daughter and I teach to have taught together. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful person. Well, they have one son, TK, that must be pretty old, too. Well, I think that she's the only one living. Is she the only I one? think so. I'm not positive, but I think uh -huh. that she's the only one living. Now, uh, getting back to your, um, your days as Cyberling, uh, what did you? What was the? What was the? Um, the highest level that you achieved at Cyberling? I was manager of the auditing department. Managing, yeah. man, managing, manager of auditing. Yeah. And were you able to, ever able to finish college? No. no you did I not went finish. to Akron U and just uh, I took a public speaking course. I think. <laughs> took a public speaking course. <laughs> just well, you to have something to do. Did a nice job of that but, because uh, you, you've done an awful lot of speaking. Now. <clears throat> In addition to all of these good things that you did, that you have done, uh, from starting from working on the railroad and pounding and being a spiker, and then going down to the brickyard and uh, serving there with your father and driving a, a big horse around with um, uh, who picked up the ashes and all those other kinds of things, uh, you were the only one in your family who worked during 1928-29. Is that correct? Well, yes. Then because uh, things, things were bad. Things a little better, and, they, and uh, 
yeah, it was tough years. Very tough years. Very and you tough. went to college and you came back and you became involved with Cyberlink. So we would have to probably say that your career was spent at Cyberlink Rubber Company. Right. Pretty well so. Right. And Garden Christian did something else for the Wadsworth community other than to, to show us what kind of metal a person of your stature has. You became heavily involved with the scouting program. Yes. Tell us about the scouting program in Wadsworth and where you did it and with whom and who were some of the outstanding scouts. And we're going to read a letter pretty soon yeah. from one who wrote, who wrote back and told us about the uh, influence that you had on his life. But you had influence on the lives of hundreds and hundreds of students and people in this community. Well, and that's what we re really that's going right. to remember you for. You know, sometimes when you receive something, you try to get something back. That's what it's well, when to be. I was 12 years old, we came to Wadjeth. We had two Scott troops in, in Wadjeth. They were city troops. They were sponsored by service clubs, I believe. And Ted Foley was the Scott master. And, uh, and I think Leon Jones or Bill Shank was Scott master of the, uh, the other troop. Anyway, I wanted to join the Scots because all my friends in the neighborhood were Scots. My mother, got the idea that Scots troops or Scotting was some sort of a military organization. Uh -huh. And she would not give me approval to join the Scouts. And I begged and pleaded for two years. So when I was 14 years old, which is old to join, I joined the Scouts finally the with Scouts. her permission. Two months later, she said, this is the best thing that ever happened to you. This is a, um, Let's see if I get this right. This is the, the, the scouting, um, what would you call this? The um, membership card, the registration, registration card. Registration card. The registration card that um, you have. And if you turn it over, you will see here that it was August 18th, 1922, that you became qualified as a tenderfoot. That is right. And. Um, that uh, Theodore Foley was your scoutmaster That's right. on the 18th day of August, and you were 14 years of age. Yep. From 1922, for the next 50 years, you would be involved with scouting in one way or another and that is right. making a strong contribution. Can you tell us about your, your life in scouting and, and what you did? Oh, it was just simply wonderful. The, this man, Ted Foley, had a great influence on my life. And, uh, right there is Garden Christian having received the Silver Beaver Award. Tell us about the Silver Beaver Award before we go back to the other Silver Beaver Award. Well, Silver Beaver Award is uh, few, few are given to outstanding service for people who are associated in scouting. And you never know who it is. And I was in Atlanta working in the office there, and I got a call to come back to the factory that I was needed. That's all it told me. So I hopped the first plane and came back. And they said, well, the only thing we can tell you is you're supposed to be in Camp Manitoka at such and such a time on such and such a night, which is about the next evening. And that was then presented. Silver Beaver. What, what is the significance of the Silver Beaver War? You got this in 1952. What is the significance of it? That was 30 years after you started scouting. Yes, it's for outstanding service. And uh, very few are given. I think there are maybe eight or 10 on watches at present. Eight or ten. Who yeah. else has a Silver Beaver Award in Wadsworth right now? Well, uh, Lloyd Ebert had it. I don't know if you remember Lloyd. Yes, I remember Lloyd. Uh, Art Storm had it. Art Storm, I remember him too. And uh, I believe, uh, I believe that uh, somebody in the 404 troop had it too. 404? Yeah. I didn't know that we had a 404. We had 402 and that 406. That is the Sacred Heart Church. 406. Oh, yeah, 406. 406. Mm -hmm. and Joe uh, Ludwig? Ludwig. Yeah, Joe he Ludwig. He may have had it. Mm -hmm. He was quite an athlete. Yes, he was. And, uh, we liked Oh, there's several in Lodges that have it. Mm -hmm. I just can't remember all the names. So you began working with scout troops as a scout yourself in 1922. Yes. Then when did you become involved with helping other scouts work? Well, uh, when I... Graduated from the troops, so to speak, uh, go through through tenderfoot patrol leader, senior patrol leader, assistant scoutmaster, and I became a scoutmaster. And that was my joy. I worked with some wonderful people and boys. And, and in those days, 
camping was not like it is today. We went out with the bare necessities and we were able to go into farms with an owner's permission. We could have a fire, we could cook, we could go swimming, we could uh, have lots of fun and it was all uh, our own making. No electric generators. No electric generators, no television, <laughs> no radios. No boom boxes. No blue, no. It was really, really nice. And so I did a lot of that. And uh, so uh, uh, I became Scott Master, and I was on the district committee. I was the chairman there, and I was on the Akron Area Council Committee. And I ran some training courses. I uh, had charge of a troop from the Wadsworth area that went to Colorado Springs for Jamboree. I had 44 boys, or 40 boys and some leaders. There were 70,000 boys there. 70,000. Between Colorado Springs and Denver. Wow. And the day we checked in there, they killed three rattlesnakes. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but we didn't see any the rest of the week. I think they all <laughs> hold up someplace because of the boys running around. I imagine 70,000 people would scare anybody out. But, uh, yeah, that was... Scary. Right here we have a pin that's 75 years old. Would you tell us what that pin's all about? That is my first class pin that was given to me when I became a first class scout. You start first out class. with tenderfoot, second class, first class, and then you earn merit badges and become eagle if possible. And what about this one? That is one I wouldn't take a million dollars for. Oh, really? That is an honor camping badge from Camp Manitowoc. And uh, I wore that for years and years on my... And this is the Order of the Air. That's another honor that's given for outstanding camp. Order of the Arrow. Order of the Arrow. <clears throat> and that's just really something. As I promised, forget. we're going to read a letter from one of your scout people. But before we do that, I'd like to have you tell us who some of the people were that you influenced as a scout master. Who were some of the people that we know today as prominent people in Wadsworth? Well, uh, Lawrence Good stopped by Sunday for a minute. He lives up in Michigan. And he reiterated that phase of it. And uh, uh, Jimmy Jessel, for example. Uh, Johnny Drive. Jimmy had a brother in uh, Barberton, too, that was in our troop for a while. And uh, Randall Zepp, if you remember Randall. Surely. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alan Ball, George Allen Ball. Sorry, George Allen Ball, this morning. This morning. Mm -hmm. And he was in. and so George Allen Ball's father was the match person. Wasn't yes, mm -hmm. yes. So he was, a, he was a, an executive at the match, was yeah. he? Yeah. We had a, a, a Scotter quartet that I sang in for years and years and years. There was George Edis and Lloyd Ebert and myself and Dale Crumley. And we would go around and sing for scouting occasions and, and that sort of thing. Well, we're going to get to your music here, and George Edis is now gone, is he now? Yes. But George is a tenor, as I remember. No, he was bass. Well, he was bass, and you were the tenor. I was the tenor. You were the tenor, okay. I remember George, and I know your portrait very well. And we're going to be talking about that in a minute, but who are some of the other people that you can remember who went through your scouting troops? Well, let's see. There was Jim Burbage and Calmer Clifford. Calmer Clifford was an optometrist. And my son, Bill. Jim Burbage just died, didn't Just he? died a just couple died. weeks ago. Uh, his sister works yeah. up at um, uh, Liberty. Liberty Commons, yeah. or Liberty uh, Residence. Residence. And, um, I was such a pity about Jim passing on. Yes. And uh, Jeepers. There was my two nephews. Uh, uh, let's see. Dan Christian and Tim Christian and Danny Christian and Roger, or Gary Christian <laughs> were all of my A lot troops. of Christians in that yeah. group. Right. And, uh, oh, gee. I'm going to read a story from Clyde Morrison. Yes. This is April 29th, 97. Dear Garland, this is a letter from someone in your past, and unless you remember all of the boys in your scout troop, I, sus I suppose that you don't remember me. Well, I asked Gar uh, Garland about this, and of course he remembers him. I was on Troop 402 in the 40s. In high school, I dated Jane Armstrong, one of Janice's friends, and also ran around with Calmer, uh, Calmer, Calmer Clifford. Now, Janice is your daughter. Yes. Right. So he ran around with Janice and uh, Calmer, Calmer Clifford. I still correspond with Calmer by email. Calmer is an optometrist here in Wadsworth. 
and um, he unfortunately was afflicted with a muscular disease, was he not, and can no longer do that, but his brain is still as keen as it can be. And what a wonderful, great, uh, great person he was. I've known him for 60 years, 50 years at least. And he recently sent me a telephone book of Wadsworth. I noticed your name in there and remembered that I had not remembered to thank you for all that you did for me. Now, isn't that nice that this young lad would be doing that? When I was in high school, maybe it was King Sears psychology class, or perhaps it was the Explorer Scouts or someone er somewhere else, someone told me that if I admired someone who was happy and seemed to have a good life, I should emulate that person so that I would have the good life too. So I started trying to be like you and a couple of the other people I knew. Although I was doing very poorly in school at the time, and, Cl and Clyde did not do that poorly, but he's uh, degrading himself here, I turned it around and went to college because you had done so. Now there's an inspiration that caused a person to do something that he probably would not have done. I sang in the church choir and also the school choir, although I didn't have a particularly good voice. Here's another thing that you probably helped him because of your voice. I played church league softball. I even forced myself to listen to classical music and attempt to do some outside of school reading. It worked. I've had a wonderful life and just last year retired from teaching after 37 years in the same high school in Phoenix, Arizona. I finished my master's and have over 100 hours beyond the master's. I was working on my PhD when my wife ran for and became a state senator and my sons became little league age. Also, the school said that 72 hours of graduate work beyond the master's was equivalent to a PhD on the salary schedule, so therefore I stayed there. I also started coaching the girls' varsity softball team and then the, became the English department chairman as, at a school that was the best academic school in Phoenix at the time. I taught Latin, English, and humanities during those 37 years and hated to retire early, but the school set up a buyout program and would pay me to retire at the time. I keep hearing how poorly teachers are paid, but in Arizona I think we are paid well and the retirement system is, is excellent. My wife Betty and I own our own tour company. We go to Europe a couple of times a year. Actually this year it will be three times. Thanks in part to you my life has been most enjoyable. Now I'm enjoying my retirement with lots of golf in the winter in Phoenix and the summer in Flagstaff where we have a summer home. We also get at least three days of bridge a week in Flagstaff and belong to a duplicate bridge club down here in the valley. I still do a lot of enjoyable reading and listen to classical music when on my Walkman as I walk four miles every day to stay healthy. I did not pass on the legacy of being a role model and scouts to for young boys, but I attempted to do so in my teaching in school. I enjoyed the students and attempted to do as many school activities, activities as I could and to get the new the students out of school as well as in school. Bringing up the fact that Johnny had a good football or basketball game the night before would really pique him for the following day in class. I attended a great many concerts and dance recitals too. So thanks in part, the, thank you for the part you played in helping me to grow up and to construct a very pleasant life. Sincerely, Clyde Morrison. Now, isn't that a beautiful letter? Sure is. And I suspect that he probably wrote that for the hundreds and hundreds of people who, uh, whom you helped. Probably. How many people do you think that you might have influenced during your period of time there in, in um, uh, scouting for 50 years? I've tried to figure that out a lot of times, and that, gee, it must be four or five hundred. I don't know. Oh, I'll bet it's more than that. We had an awful lot of boys go through our troop and in uh, that many years wide. Now this troop 402 was in the Methodist Church yes. and then 406 was in the Catholic Church. Yes. But you were very closely aligned with the two of them, were you not? Oh yes. The Methodist Church holds another area of um, excellence for you. Uh, you're very religious and uh, you uh, became quite involved with what part of the Methodist Church? Well, probably Two areas specifically. One was uh, when my wife and I were married, we were instrumental in forming a new Sunday school class. And what was the name of that Sunday school? Aldersgate. The Aldersgate yes. Sunday school class. While and we're talking about your wife, who was your wife? And she's gone now, unfortunately. But she was Catherine Shank. From? From Wadsworth. Wadsworth. And who was her father? Her father was Bill Shank. He who worked was? The traffic 
man our assistant manager to high match high match Shane. and he was our Sunday school teacher for 23 years of this class that we formed and your wife's first name was Catherine and her Edna she had Catherine. a sister Pauline Pauline yes and Pauline graduated in 1939 that's right she's 76 years old yes is she still living oh yes she's still living yes and whom did she marry she married Don Nellis Don Nellis yes uh, who's um, Aunt Gertrude Dallas Gertrude still Nellis. lives in Wadsworth, yes. right? And Gertrude is about, well, oh, I'm yeah, not allowed yeah. to say how old she is. <laughs> She'll kill me if I, I tell how old she is. But uh, she is a retired school teacher, and we've been trying to get her on this program. She won't come, but we're going to try to get her. Maybe you can call her and ask her to, because she has so much history to give us. Yeah. She married the, uh, into the Nellis family. Yes. Pauline did. Yes. And then uh, you married, so um, Don Nellis is your brother-in-law. Yes. And Don is probably what... Uh, 76 or 77 years old? Huh? I would say so, yeah. Somewhere in that area. And where does Don live? Where did Don and Pauline live? They live down in the uh, uh, Washington, D.C. area. And, and they have a family. Yes. Now, you and your wife started the Aldersgate class at the Methodist Church. Well, we were instrumental. There were others working in that, but... Uh, you were instrumental in starting you know, it. Why did you call it the Aldersgate? Well, uh, we did a little historical okay. research and came That's up right. with that for what it stood for. And what does it stand for? Very few people understand what Aldersgate means. Well, I think it probably it's a new new beginning. Uh, it's a, maybe a good name. and uh, so. It comes from what in, in uh, biblical history? Gee. I don't know if it's I can't say. Well, really. We'll uh, we'll pick that up maybe in a few minutes, but um, it certainly has a significance. <clears throat> the um, Aldersgate class comprised what kinds of people, uh, Garland? The, were the adults or children or family? Adults or? now, yes. What was it then? It was adults. And uh, what kinds of adults? These were the ones who. Um, um, who wanted to, uh, uh, were they rearing families? Were they all pretty well your own age? Yes. And they're all, yes. Your own age. They all had families, yes. did yeah. they not? I'll give us some of the people. There was uh, okay. uh, Bob Crumrine and, and uh, West Virginia Allen and uh, uh, George Edis and Laura Louise, Kenneth Fenton and his wife, Ad Adrian Feed, Freed and his wife, and uh, Hard Good, and Wayne Good and their wives. And, George Lorenz and his wife, so on and so forth. And then they were all with young children at the time. Yes. Who were your young children at the time? Uh, well, my daughter was, well, in fact, my wife couldn't come to the first meeting because we had a new daughter at home, right. her Janice. That's right. mm -hmm. and, and then uh, two, late, two years later, Carol came along, and then nine years later, Bill came along. And so the three children. The three children. Now, um, Carol is how old now? Carol will be 60, I believe. And she's the oldest. No, Janice is the oldest. Oh, Janice, Janice is the oldest. 62. Okay, Jana, how old is Janice then? 62. I thought Janice was younger than Carol. Mm -mm. Janice is the oldest. Oh, wow. She's 62 years old then. Yes. Oh, my heavens. I didn't realize she was that old. She, I thought last uh, January 1st, she just received her doctor's degree in psychology. Isn't that <laughs> She's, something? That's how She wanted to do this. Well, you know, a mountain is the climb. And if she lives to be as old as her father, uh -huh. she can have 30 more years of, um, of uh, productive work. Yeah. Um, what about um, Carol? Carol? How old is she and where is she? Carol is 60 and she lives in Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado. Yeah. Okay. She loves it. And uh, what about your son? Bill is Bill. Uh, uh, 51, and he lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte, North Carolina. So we're talking about <clears throat> 60 years ago that you started the Aldersgate class. Just, just about. Just Aldersgate about 60. is almost 60 years old. Yes, almost, almost 60 yeah. years ago. So that 1937, yeah. you started the Aldersgate yeah. class. Uh, and these were the people who were in it. Why did you feel it was necessary to start another class of Sunday school people? Well, Besides the fact that these were all young couples and they all had children and so forth and so on. What was happening in the Methodist Church at that time in Wadsworth? Well, it was beginning to get a little... Classes were filled up, shall we say, and we were naturally leaning toward people our own age. That's right. It's got a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted to be together, so we formed a new class. And since that time, that there's been lots of new classes formed behind There us. have been, yes. yes. But until that and time, what were the classes of the Methodist Church? 
Well, there was the uh, Gleaner class. Gleaner class, which yeah, was they, the one of the older ones, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And then there was a fellowship class, I believe is the name of it. I didn't realize it was the fellowship class. I knew about the Gleaner class. And yeah. The people in the Gleaner class were would now be close to 100 years old, yes. or, or beyond that, as yes. a matter of fact. Yes. I knew some of the people who were in that. Yes. They were old teachers in my school when I was yes. in school 50 years ago, so they would be up in years. You said that there were two things that you did in the Methodist Church. What was the other thing that you did in the Methodist Church, which I think is particularly significant, you're still doing it? Well, I th I'll have to go with the choir. You have to what? <laughs> have to go with the choir. With the choir. And I what did you do choir with the choir? for like 60 years. 60 years. And um, what are you still doing in music? Well, I'm singing in a chorus up at Liberty. And uh, in fact, uh, another man and I sang a duet last night at uh, the celebration we had there for birthdays there. What did you sing? Uh, um, what did we sing last night? Ivory Palaces, I believe it was. What was it? Ivory Palaces. Ivory Palaces. Who else sang with you? A man by the name of Kenny uh, Klontz. And uh, he's from out of town. I never knew him before. I don't know that name. No. How do you spell his name? K L O N T Z, I believe. Klontz, K L O N T Z. Yeah. He's not from Wadsworth. No. no. And how old is Kenny? Oh, I suppose he's uh, middle 70s. Middle 70s. His and what wife, does he sing? Is he bass or? He was singing tenor last night. I sang the lead. And he sang you sang the lead and he sang tenor. Yeah. Um, what else do you do with the uh, with uh, Liberty um, residents now musically? Well, we have this course. It's comprised of about a dozen ladies and three or four men. And we are singing down yeah. Sterling Oaks in a week or so to go down and sing for. You're the director of that, right? No, no. Uh, Dolores the, Burbage is. Dolores Burbage, Coppice. or Coppice, now Coppice, Virgil, or, yeah. uh, Roger Coppice's wife. Uh, she married Roger Coppice, yes. the, older, the oldest of the Coppice boys yeah. from, um, from that family, Virgil and uh, Joanne and uh, Vivian yeah. are uh, siblings of Roger Coppice. And um, uh, as we said, yeah. Joanne Burbage's uh, brother just yeah. died uh, in Florida, was it not? Yeah. Now, um, tell us about all of the choir directors and organists that you can remember at the Methodist Church from the time that you began singing some, well, more than 60 yeah. years ago. You started singing about um, 70 years ago, yeah. didn't you? 70 years, yes. 70 years ago. And who were, who were well, some of the people? Well, two outstanding directors, Kingsley Sears. Kingsley Sears was one. Gene Lawrence. Okay. Kingsley Sears was there from probably in the 30s, maybe even 20s, I'm not sure, yeah. 30s. Kingsley yeah. Sears used to live on High Street, and he was the music director of the at the Wadsworth High School. And he had a son, Kingsley Sears, who was yeah. still living. Yeah. And um, he married um, um, Ruby. Uh, Ruby Wilkinson Sears. Yeah. And they met at Baldwin Wallace College yes. many, many years ago, probably 70 years ago or so. And Kingsley Sears dropped over dead about how many years ago? The father, uh, Kingsley Sears, uh, the senior. Mm. I suppose 10 years. I oh, more than that, more. I think. Well, maybe. maybe so. But he dropped over dead. And Ruby's also gone now, too. Yeah. Uh, King Sears lives in Michigan, and yeah. I think he's also a musician. Kingsley Sears had a beautiful voice, and he had one of the best choirs in town, not only at the high school, mm -hmm. but at the, at the, um, at the uh, Methodist Church. Now, this is when the Methodist Church was on, South, on Main Street. Yes. There's no such thing as South Main Street, because it's only Main Street. And... <clears throat> Uh, at that time, who were some of the people who sang in the, the choir? Uh, I'll start you off. Uh, Mrs. Rohr was one of the people who sang, but yeah. who else sang in the choir? Mrs. Rohr, of course, Ruby Sears, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, there was, uh, I'm trying to think, George Edis. George Edis. And uh, Harvey Werner, uh, Hugh Deem, and Rachel. And Hubert's, John and Betty, and uh, uh, sopranos, tenors, Bob Moss, and oh, I just so many names to escape me right. Mm -hmm. Then, when King Sear, who was the organist at the time? Matilda Close. Mrs. Close, yes. 
She was one of the organists there. She was for a long time. For many, many, many yeah. years, right. And yeah. um, a good organist, too. Yeah. She was the wife of Frank Close, the superintendent of schools, and they lived on Ohio Avenue. Yeah. Do you remember um, who took over right after King Sears left? I believe it was uh, a man from up at school, and I've forgotten his name. He didn't stay very long. No. No. We had Specky Baldwin that was an organist for a while, Now, too. Specky Baldwin was an organist. He's a tremendous yes, he uh, was. showman, a tremendous yes, organist. he was. What was his real name? His Gordon. First name? Gordon Baldwin, that's right. And he was married to Elva Brittinger. Yes. Whose maiden name was Hartman. And Elva was also a very good pianist, yes. but... Um, uh, Gordon Baldwin was, uh, well, he was actually a professional musician. Mm -hmm. Now, you smiled when you talked about Gordon Baldwin. Why did you smile? Oh, he was, he was a, uh, I don't know, I like Gordon, I don't know what you, he was, he appealed to me. He, he, he was a, a number one musician. Oh, he was, he's an outstanding oh, musician. Yes, he could he do anything. He was Vance, Go Vance Baldwin's uh, yeah. Uh, brother. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think he played at the Lowe's Theater for a while. And that oh, he did, organ yes. over there, yeah, yeah and then come up out of the floor. Very, very good. Uh, not the type of person you would think of being in a church choir. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's probably why you're chuckling, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't stay too terribly long in that not position. Not too long. No. But, uh, then who, who became the organist after that? Oh, jeepers. See, a present one is... Brenda Adley. Brenda Adley is Gordon Baldwin's nephew's daughter. Yes. Gordon Baldwin, uh, uh, Deborah Adley used to be oh. um, Deborah Baldwin, who is Tom Baldwin, not not um, Homer Baldwin's son Tom, but uh, Vance Baldwin's son Thomas. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay, Tom Baldwin. Tom Baldwin is 67 years old or so. So we don't, don't, don't get him confused because there's another Tom Baldwin who is the son of uh, Homer Baldwin. Oh. And uh, he has the print shop, uh, that, that <clears throat> sign making place in Wadsworth. Uh, but Deborah is, is yeah. uh, Tom's daughter. And Tom was uh, um, Gordon Baldwin's nephew. I have trouble remembering those names. Uh, but I know we had a series of organists. And, uh, you had many right after yes. another. As a matter of fact, a, you also had a, a, a Mrs. Belcastro. Yes, a Mary Belcastro. Mary Belcastro played for a while. Then you had some people coming in yeah. from Akron. And, all yeah. and now you have um, Deb, Debbie playing. Uh, when did um, uh, Jean Lawrence become involved with the music department there at um, uh, the Methodist Church? Oh, I, I think he's got about ever since. No. He's been retired how many years? Oh, five, six, seven, five eight. Five or six, when like he that. came to us, probably, I'd say 15 years. Oh, longer than that. Maybe, maybe 20. Oh, yeah, longer than that, yeah. Uh, he, um, I think that he was the choir director um, maybe as many as 25 to 30 years Could ago be. for a while, so. He, now, he comes up at uh, Liberty once a month. We have a birthday celebration for all birthdays during that month, and I sat right beside him last night, and oh, he can play that piano. Oh, he can play <laughs> that, that piano was built for him. He yeah. does a beautiful job, and everything sounds oh, yeah. as if, uh, and he has such, such fun playing it, too. Oh, yeah. He was the music director at the high school yes. uh, for many years, yes. um, then he retired. Now, we have a, a couple of minutes left. This takes a lot. Uh, there are so many interesting things to do here. We would like uh, to have you, just before we uh, go on to the next period of questioning, to tell us something that you would like to tell us about. I've been asking you questions. What would you like to tell us about uh, that you think is so significant about um, your association with Wadsworth? Well, I, uh, I like the people in Wadsworth. Um, and I have the philosophy that uh, if you treat somebody right, they reciprocate. And I have found that to be very, very true. And uh, I've always gotten along with uh, people who other people doesn't seem to get along with. And uh, I would have to say the people are really marvelous. Everyone has, I've asked that question to, has said something very close to that. The that people right? in Wadsworth are just outstanding. One of the, um, 
Now, one of the features of this program is that it brings out the, the true life of the person we're interviewing. If someone were to see Garland Christian today, you would say, well, this man has always been a very successful man. He has always been uh, at the high end of the scale, and he has always uh, done the things which he wanted to do because he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. We know that isn't true. That's you were right. born in the Ozarks. You moved to Burbank. Your father was a railroader. You served two terms on the railroad. You were a spiker. You went down to the brickyard and worked until midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning, went back to school the following day and so forth. Couldn't get a job, finally got a job at Cybernet. So you, didn't, you weren't really born with a silver sp no. uh, spoon in your mouth, were you? Far from it. Now, this is what has been the underlying tone of almost every person we have had that these people, way back in the very, very early days of Wadsworth, or their early days in Wadsworth, struggled, struggled hard, but you made it. And one of the things that also is underlying is that every single one of these people we have uh, interviewed has helped somebody else make it. You helped kids make it through scouting. Besides helping kids make it through scouting, and you're probably not going to respond to this because you're too humble, what other kinds of things have you done to help people in Wadsworth? And if you don't tell us, I'll tell them. <laughs> I don't know. Well, how about counseling people who needed to help be counseled? Did you ever do that? Yes. What kinds of people, then? you don't have to give any names, but what, what, what stands out in your mind as having counseled some people in Wadsworth and helping them along? And I think uh, probably mostly just sometimes ability to listen to somebody unload their troubles and then you may maybe uh, make a suggestion or here and there. If you uh, don't reveal any, any details, can you tell us of some instances which were really, really outstanding of a, an individual or individuals? Well, recently we had a, a man <coughs> that accidentally <laughs> chopped up my little garden I had, mm -hmm. and I was very bitter for a few days, and we had a few words, and then I got to think of this isn't right. And I go back and make amends and talk to him. And That's he, the kind of Garland Christian we know, the yeah. person who follows the, the, the religion that he believes in so strongly that yeah. uh, even though his garden is chopped up. But I wasn't thinking of that particularly right this very moment. Um, and, I'm, and I can understand why you would not want to because you might, might divulge some confidences there that we don't want to. How about um, uh, financial help? that you've had to give some people, and you have done so. Is that correct? Yes, that's uh, correct. And, and uh, you don't have to give names, but um, uh, how did that come about? People have called me when they knew that you were going to be on this program, and they said that you have been one of the most generous people in the world for many, many people in Wadsworth. Well, I don't know. I, I think if you see the need and, and do something about it, I think it helps two people. Have you helped anyone who wanted to go to school? Yes. Uh, to the tune of some pretty good bucks, is that yeah, correct? that's right. Now, you don't have to get names, but um, are those people whom you helped um, successful today? I would say so, yep. very definitely. Are they still in Wadsworth, some of them? Uh, most of them were scattered, yeah. But you, you know. helped a lot of them, didn't you? I've helped a few people. Yeah, yeah. Yes. A few people. <laughs> that isn't what we heard. We, we know that you've helped a lot of them. One of the last things that I, I need to ask you, uh, Garland, is uh, that um, I send a letter to all of the ones who have been interviewed so far to appear with us on the 5th of September, uh, Friday morning, at um, 9 o'clock. And my understanding is that you did not get that letter. Is that right? No, I haven't so far. Well, there's a letter supposed to be out there, and I it just I, I mailed them. I didn't mail them from Wadsworth, and I've been checking up on all of these people to make sure that everyone got a letter. And so far, I have two people who did not get letters. So you did not get a letter. But we want to invite you back on the 5th of September. On yesterday's program, I said erroneously the 6th of September. It is on Friday, September 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, at 9 o'clock in the morning. And we're going to meet at the Board of Education office 
um, down on College Street because we, we're going to have 21 people there and we're going to let them just reminisce for two hours. Oh. And the only thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to be there with a whistle in case you, that, that group of 80, 90, 80 and 90 year old people gets too unruly, I'll pull the whistle. <laughs> but in the meantime, we want to say thank you for sharing with us the history of Wadsworth from the Ozarks to the present day and your past 75 years in, or 75 years in Wadsworth. Thank so thank you again, we're so appreciative. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. Charlie Denny and today's business profile is Wadsworth Bike and Shop on Wachusa Avenue. And this morning we have with us uh, the owner of the business, uh, Mr. Joe Townsley. Hi, Charlie. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Good to see you. And Phil, right. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe, how long have you been in business here? Well, this is two months into my 15th year. Good. And how did you? from a uh, large wheel in the front and a real small wheel in the back uh, to uh, the old balloon tire bike that we knew when we were in small and younger. And as I guess they're back again, they're back in a number of different forms. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how the bike has evolved over the years, uh, what you have now? 